Hello, my name is Margaret Gold, and sadly, I'm still sitting in Leiden in the Netherlands, looking out at a grey, uh, grey rainy day as our fall turns into winter weather. And I'm not with you in the room as you head from uh, spring into summer. But I thank you very much for inviting me to share with you the story of four waves of citizen science being in motion. And of course, these waves are not only about these levels I'd like to talk to you about from global and in Europe nationally in the Netherlands and a very local story here in Leiden. Uh, but this is in the context of, of much bigger waves of, of urgency that we need to tackle, tackle together these issues together. And of course, you've been discussing some beautiful examples of citizen science in the ground these last few days, locally in Australia and from other places around the world where people are coming together to tackle these tackle some of these urgent issues. I know that biodiversity is very much on the radar, climate change very much on the radar of many of you in the room today. And I'd like to give it a little bit of the context um, as you talk about your themes of inspire and impact and influence. The story of the four waves is also about this movement from away from this kind of deficit model of sharing our knowledge with you, the society, coming from science to society. Uh, as the havers of knowledge and really flipping the script to be collaborating together and recognizing local local knowledge and um, indigenous knowledge. And I know that these are themes that are very much alive for you in your discussions uh, over these days. But the story I'd like to tell you starts at the global level. And I know that there's going to be another talk on the program that will go into greater depth about the work that's being done by UNESCO and the open science recommendations at UNESCO. But I'd like to give that a little bit of the, the framing for these movements for citizen science that have really been boosted by what's happening with this declaration that science is a common, a common good, a human right, access to knowledge. And within the open science recommendation, citizen science is really strongly at the heart of this and the engagement of societal actors as participants throughout the entire process, certainly with uh, citizen science, but also other forms of opening up science to the participation of societal actors. And I hope that you know about the Global Citizen Science Partnership, which the Australian Citizen Science Association is one of the founding members of. And you'll recognize uh, the, uh, Libby Hepburn in this photo as one of the active people in the Citizen Science Global Partnership, leading a, a number of working groups, really pulling together all of these different players around the world and moving citizen science forward. But one of the working groups that we've worked uh, work with in the global level is informing UNESCO about how to translate these recommendations into actual policy advice, how to bring that into operation and embed that, in this case, in member states at the national level. And the first piece of, of work that we that we gave to open science to the UNESCO open science recommendations was how to more thoroughly do this. And it's a it's a really thorough piece of work that I'd like to share just um, one of the key takeaways with you, which is about, about the idea of the enabling environment. And this is another theme throughout which I'd, I'd like to uh, talk, talk to you today about these uh, different waves of, of movements for citizen science. And it's a recognition of this need for an enabling environment that supports and sustains and gives longevity to citizen science initiatives such that they can have impact. And this past year in particular, um, in here in Europe, we've been doing a huge piece of work about, about this as well. But another community of practice that I hope that you know about is the European Citizen Science Association, which of course is a membership of many European, many European nations and sister nations and um, memorandums of understanding with, uh, with uh, also the Australian Citizen Science Association, for example, to exchange uh, information with each other. And a particular project at the moment, the European Citizen Science Project, is about um, continuing the building of, um, of capacity for doing citizen science, skills exchange, knowledge exchange. And one of the key platforms where we're doing this is the EU Citizen Science Platform. Um, uh, thanks to European funding from the European Commission, it is framed as a European platform. But of course, it's global. It's open to all. It's multilingual. And it's an amazing place for sharing projects and resources. And tr and uh, there's a discussion forum, which is uh, less, less successful. But the rich, rich knowledge sharing that's happening here, we really invite you to, to turn to this. But uh, part of this is about the European investment, the European Commission investment in this knowledge exchange. It's part of the enabling environment that's being built up here. And this, this 
this comes from a lot for a large part through recognition that citizen engagement and citizen participation in the aims of the fund, European funding program, these big missions towards climate, tackling uh, climate change and, and other innovation missions, that citizen science is really a key part of this at the very heart. And it, throughout all of our funding programs, the research and innovation funding program, um, the, the large missions to achieve a, a sort of a moonshot orientation towards uh, to achieving these big missions, citizen engagement and societal engagement is actually a core criteria through all of these funding programs. If you look at some of the missions, such as the, the cancer mission or 100 climate neutral cities mission, citizen engagement is a criteria within the funding. And, and it's recognized throughout that citizen science and other public engagement or participatory practices are, are very much at the heart of this. And one p particular piece of work that I'd really like to share with you was a mutual learning exchange that was um, that was conducted over the course of a year with a, a, 11 different countries that um, that indicated their desire to take part in this. And a, and a group of people that are really active in citizen science from a research or practitioner's point of view, guiding the conversation of five key topics, looking at just a basic overview of what are all of the different types and flavors and impacts of citizen science. How do we go about good practice and quality assurance, maximizing relevance and impact? But once again, this idea of the enabling factors uh, came out. This repository, and I'll make sure you have my slides afterwards with these links, this repository contains all of the reports and all of the work that was done during the course of the year with this mutual learning exercise. Um, and the people that participated in it from the 11 countries were people from the national ministries and, and research councils and funding bodies. They were not people from universities or from um, NGOs on the ground. These were the policy actors who could play a role in creating some of this enabling environment. And that was really a core theme throughout. Um, one of the discussion papers that's um, that's interesting to point out to you is this particular one in preparation for the conversations about enabling environments, because it uh, it summarized um, I, I think as many as ten different policy briefs that came out of different European citizen science projects um, at the European scale over the over the past ten years with recommendations to policy about what kind of support and sustaining is needed. Which, of course, begs the question in more detail, what is an enabling environment? Uh, so we, we took it apart in terms of a number of core aspects that, that are needed in order to really address how to support and sustain citizen science further. And a lot of this thinking came out of uh, one specific project called We Observe, where we looked at um, another way of understanding what sustainability is. So not in terms of planetary sustainability or um, circular sustainability, but the sustaining of the initiative of the community and the main elements that are needed for that. There's a technology or platform element that needs to be continued to be maintained and developed. Communities need to, that once they've built up and become active, they need to be sustained and supported over a longer period of time. And of course, pretty much everything boils down to funding. At the end of the day, the, that coordination, that ongoing development requires ongoing funding as well. So in giving this a bit of a shaping framework, we pulled apart these core elements of what an enabling environment is. You won't be surprised to see funding once again at the heart of all of those. All of these things require funding. But I'd like to point out societal dialogue as one of the key elements. And, and here we come back again to the themes that you're, just ta that you're talking about throughout this conference, about inspiring and influencing and having impact, that it's all about doing this together in dialogue, that you need that two-way traffic throughout. And it's not just top-down uh, policy but and, and, and grassroots never to meet in the middle. It very much finds its biggest power meeting in the middle and collaborating together. And in the final report from this mutual learning exercise, um, the UR link uh, there at the bottom, zoomed in on a couple of really key things that are needed to support citizen science. Um, it, it, things like the, the research infrastructure, the technological infrastructure won't surprise you. Um, national networks of, of practitioners that are sharing knowledge and know-how with each other, just as you are these, these days together at the, at the AXA conference. But also a bigger culture change that's part of moving moving science to a more open way of operating, transparent, um, reusable, uh, re reapplicable, 
and also across the world in different contexts and different cultures, this, this larger culture change of opening up knowledge production processes. Now the mutual learning ex exercise, because we had national actors as our, as our participants, the funding bodies, the ministries, we talked about how do you get from a strategic vision for where you're trying to go in the national scientific landscape or the research landscape to really tangible things that you can do to build these enabling environments. And we use this concept of the backcasting approach, where you start by looking forward to what, your, what the ultimate vision in, is, but then you come right back to where you are at the present day and saying, okay, what 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 is in place where and every country is going to be in different different stages with different elements one that might be really strong in the research libraries and another might be really strong in grassroots engagement and filling in the gaps from there for how do we get to the ultimate vision and we talked about this vision for an enabling environment for citizen science and what are those what are then those pillars that you're working towards and and starting with that vision, first of all, that citizen science is embedded in mainstream research and innovation, um, that citizen science data is integrated in policy making and decision making processes, that citizen science practices are supported, and no matter what what level or or organizational framework those are in, that they're supported, and that the networks, these practitioner networks and knowledge exchange networks, are strengthened. And finally, that knowledge is inclusive, uh, that we're, we're recognizing and respecting other forms of knowing, other ways of knowing and traditional knowledge. So bringing this down to the national level, as this was our advice, how do you embed this at the national level? I'd like to share with you the story of, of what's been happening in the Netherlands these last uh, these last few years, in fact, particularly the National Program for Open Science. Um, and our work towards our, our vision, our strategic aims in a 20, uh, the vision for open science in the Netherlands towards 2030. The, the process in a snapshot is this lovely infographic where you see that the topics of open access, open access publishing date back to a movement that started in 2013, moving the Netherlands towards all pub, the aim of all academic publishing being 100% open access. Um, this started to embrace fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as an extension of just open data, that it's much more, um, uh, the principles of fair put it much more in use and, and much more open, op open uh, in, the hands of, in the hands of many. And these started getting woven into the open science plan, and it was really the launch of the UNESCO open science recommendations that brought engagement with societal actors as a core pillar in our own national strategic development. And here you see where we worked towards um, this past year, that top line of the rolling agenda towards open science is um, embracing societal engagement and participation. And this is where citizen science fits. But getting there was not actually an easy process because the, the the bodies that were acting in the National Program for Open Science were the traditional scientific actors in the academic community. You have the Association of Universities, the Association of Research Hospitals, the national funding bodies, the national uh, research agenda, the big uh, infrastructure data, data science center um, organizations, all of these really classic traditional open uh, science actors were opening up science with a very publication and data oriented view. And it was through once again a grassroots action. You'll you'll recognize this from your own experience as a group of citizen science practitioners on the ground went with the strength of their university basis went to the national program open science, and made the case for citizen science being a core pillar in that open science program with a, a recommendation report to establish the very first Dutch citizen science association, and clear recommendations for those structures. And they, they to give um, more tangibility to the ten principles of citizen science, which I've, I'm, I'm sure you've come across. It, it talk, taking the ten ten principles of citizen science and translating those into what you therefore should need to be reflecting on and planning for at different stages of a citizen science initiative. And it's it's a really nice piece of work that helps inform also funding bodies about criteria in, in, in the funding proposal stage and evaluation at the end of the stage. And this is the uh, Zenodo link where you can find that that matrix that talks about the quality and success success factors for citizen science that was done by the, the Dutch National Working Group for citizen science. 
So here you have the picture of what they achieved, taking this um, quite data-oriented uh, open science picture and turning citizen science program into one of the core three pillars of the Dutch um, open science movement, starting with these three program lines, which then de further developed the, the, the strategy nationally with a really large scale consultation pro process over the over the course of an entire year. Um, close to a thousand people participated in the different line discussions about what do the action lines need to be to achieve the big vision in the future. Uh, citizen science sits squarely here, as I pointed out, in our top line. And luckily, this is also translated into the launch of the first Dutch citizen science network, which now has more than 400 me members. In a few weeks, we're going to be meeting, having our second annual network day, talking about how do we organize and coordinate with each other. And you'll be um, you'll be chuffed to hear that I, I often share the story of, of the AXA model, a kind of a hub and spoke model where you've got really lovely, strong local or regional communities that are still connected together and days like uh, and days like today where you're knowledge sharing with each other as kind of a model for how we might do this in the Netherlands as well. That strategy, all of that work has been now put in the hands of our national funding body. They've got a specific um, um, governance body that will now take these and turn them into um, the investment in open science in the Netherlands. And there's a really huge financial commitment from our, our Ministry of Science and Education and Culture to make that investment into open science. Um, and this is now launched and in the coming year, this investment will start to be made also towards citizen science. So hopefully these enabling environment recommendations are going to form a really core part of this. Once again, uh, bringing us back to the UNESCO recommendations, it sits squarely here in this rec that societal actors are openly engaged with and participate in research and innovation. And I'd like to tell you about two other national movements in the Netherlands. They're really part of this story. One is um, one is a conversation about reward, rewards and recognition for researchers, that you are rewarded and recognized for the value of these open science practices. So instead of being measured on publications and high impact journals or, um, or, or, or data or um, other types of activities are being being recognized as valuable in a research career. So this includes teamwork and collegiality and bringing in funding and teaching, but it also works includes science communications and engaging with engaging with society and citizen science. So this is a really key part of the movement towards open science in the Netherlands. And many of you might also be engaged with this global conversation about advancing research assessment, having a new understanding of what we mean by excellence in research or, qual or quality in research, that it can include other types of practices and other ways of knowing and that this should also be recognized as a form of excellence. So these are very um, important parts. And then finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, grass, grassroots uh, stories here in the Netherlands. And I have, um, I have a big story to share with you, and I have a little story to share with you. But interestingly, their impacts are arguably flipped, that the really big story has a smaller impact, and it's actually the smaller story that has the bigger impact. So I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by starting with the story of the city of Leiden, where I live and work, last year having been the European City of Science. Um, it's a title that's largely awarded because you win the, you win the right to have a, a really large conference on, on Dutch soil, um, in, in this case, in the city of Leiden. It's considered the largest transdisciplinary uh, science conference in Europe. Um, and there's always a, a festival in the city, a science festival in the city that's attached to that conference. But when Leiden won this title, um, really took the view that we wanted to get out of the ivory towers and into the city. And so we actually pitched a 365 day year, days of the year, a public engagement event where the, what, what was really key is engaging the public with science and to, and and going into the city and not just the unidirectional uh, deficit model, we will tell you our, our knowledge, but really being in dialogue and talking with people in the city and finding out other the, the local knowledge, the local insights, the other ways of knowing that are that are present here in Leiden and the region. The way we did this was having a topic to spark your curiosity for every single day of the year. This was our ter ter terra page calendar for every single day of the year. 
with a topic and a QR code. And this QR code took you to information for where an event was happening, uh, possibly in your own neighborhood close to you. And they took a, a, a large a large number of forms for the wide range of, of knowledge and research and, and scientific topics that we were sharing. Um, little Tuk Tuk's gave you the QR code of what was happening that day, wherever you, and when, if you saw one of these parks somewhere in the city, you knew there was an event happening somewhere close by. And the rule was for researchers filling in these programs that you weren't allowed to do it on your own turf and it could not be a lecture, it had to be something hands-on. And 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 the goal was to get right out into the neighborhoods of, of the city, to the schools, to the library, to the marketplaces, to the shopping, uh, the shopping malls. Uh, these events were taking place all over the city. Uh, it was a massive success. We opened in the pandemic, which made uh, which made the year off to a really rough start. We didn't quite manage 365 days uh, of public engagement events, but we did get 210, which is still pretty impressive for the pandemic period. And they happened all over the city of Leiden. And at the Citizen Science Lab, which I coordinate at Leiden University, I got to be the, the owner of a number of these days, filling in the topics with some citizen science activities, some hands-on explorations around these topics. But the really big one, and this is, this is the beautiful story, was the theme of the falling star, the day of the falling star, which was the launch of Space Week. Uh, but our event in the city was an event called Seeing Stars Leiden. And it was the night that we turned the lights off in the entire city of Leiden. Uh, so we turned the lights out and part of the, the inspiration for this was to turn the stars on, to look up um, at this ancient city of astronomy with a lot of astrophysics and discoveries happening in Leiden, but you can no longer see the stars in the city of Leiden because of the light pollution. This is what Leiden looks like from space. Uh, you can see our lovely little old heart and you make out a little bit of the shape of the old city fortifications. And in the distance, you see the glow of the grass, the, the greenhouses, the glass greenhouses, which you can even see this glow from the International Space Station. So we are in one of the hot spots of light pollution in the Netherlands, let alone Europe. But the night we turned the lights off, we turned off the lights together with the city and the help of the security and the police and the bus company that had to reroute the buses in this area of the city. Um, this is about uh, 10 kilometers squared um, radius of turning off the lights in the city. And we took the opportunity to ask people, um, thanks to uh, colleagues in a, in a European project who were who were developing tools for for investigating citizen science. We we invited people to measure with us what's the impact of turning off the lights with two different mobile apps, one for Android and one for one for your smartphone, your iPhone, with a slightly different protocol to find out what we would see when we turn off the lights. Um, this is a genuine photo. This is not photoshopped. Sadly, it's a photo from our test night, middle in the night, middle in the summer, to, to make sure we knew how to turn off all the lights. You'd amaze, be amazed how often we did not know where the switches were, um, as as this as the city turning off everything the city had control over. Local businesses, residences were also invited to take part. The night itself, we actually had a little bit of cloud cover. This is an actual photo taken on the night. Lights on, lights off. And I'll share these slides with you so you can see it a little bit better. It's possible in the room that this is not coming out very clearly. The biggest impact of the night was just the so many so many thousands of people walking around the city. The Volunteer Astronomers Association had uh, had um, had the ability to gaze at the stars set up all over at different places of the city. You could look at the map and find the hot spots. And um, there was a big trumpet fanfare and um, to announce the lights turning off. And as soon as the lights went off almost everybody automatically started to talk in a whisper. There was this amazing atmosphere in the whole city. And we had a lot of people taking measurements with us. We had more than 200 people taking air, air pollution, or sorry, light pollution measurements with us. We had more than 500 data points. But sadly, the big go, no go decision of the night was whether to still do it, despite the fact there was going to be some cloud cover. You can see some Instagram photos here where you see the white clouds in the sky, even with the lights off in the city. That's the reflective power of the greenhouses bouncing off of the clouds. You could see some cloud cover. 
lots of guerrilla action, lots of people talking talking about where the lights were still on and outrage that they were on. So you'd see one photo here of students have grabbed some mattresses and leaned them against a store where the lights are still burning really brightly. And that was one of the other biggest impacts, people talking, and, and we saw this mostly in the socials, social media channels and, on, and anecdotally, talking about is all of this light really necessary? The data itself was unfortunately fairly inconclusive because of the level of, of um, clouds in the sky. We didn't have quite good enough visibility. A lot of people didn't get quite the, the angles correct to, to have a conclusive measurement. So it's very much about the experience. And maybe the act of measurement, you're looking a little bit more closely, you're more aware of what it is that you're measuring. Um, just as a little closing snapshot of, of the achievements of the year. I'd like to now tell you a smaller story, but possibly one with a bigger impact. This is a story that starts when the University of Leiden was celebrating its 444th anniversary. We're the, we're the oldest university in the Netherlands, uh, which also has its uh, disadvantages being an old traditional university. But it was an amazing occasion to celebrate. And as part of this, um, the entire re city residents and students and, and staff at all of the different knowledge and teaching institutes were invited to submit their ideas for a research question to do with the city in the city. Um, we had a big call for questions. We had a period where these were they were worked on and selected. They went on road shows to museum open days and festival nights, getting in conversation with people about these questions. And the winning question was, how much plastic and litter is in the canalways and waterways of Leiden. And this led us to develop, um, together with a, a, a lovely company called Spotteron that already had an app called Crowdwater with a small adjustment that's worked beautifully for our purposes to be able to take a photo indicating where you saw macro plastics floating in the waterways and report them. It didn't take too long before people got really quite frustrated that they were reporting this plastic, but there was nobody with the commitment to then take it out. So the, the, the phone lines were flooded, as it were, with people asking, so who took it out after I reported it? I still, Or I'm still seeing it there. Why wasn't anything done? And very quickly, this became a much more activist type of project. So it actually morphed into a canoe activity and here you can see uh, uh, some of the scientific results, um, a nice science poster about the first results of people reporting with the app where the, where the pollution was on the mobile phone and the starting point of people actively getting out in canoes to take out the take out the macro, the macro litter and look at what it is, what is it that is being found. And with the power of photo storytelling, more and more people were getting involved in the canoe activity. So now it became an activity taking these microplastics out, sorting them, seeing what it is that you find. And then the pandemic hit. What did we start finding? We started finding gloves, masks, and it, we had a whole other layer to the scientific outcomes and impact story of what was being found with the microplastics in the canals of Leiden. And these led not only to scientific findings about urban uh, urban waterways and the, the types of litter and the sources, but it led to policy impact. This is a local older woman who's in charge of, of the, the, the restaurants and cafes in the city and a report of how much was blowing into the canals from the, the, the terrace restaurant and cafe tables and recommendations to cafe and restaurant owners about what small measures could be done so that less would blow into the water. And now pretty much everywhere in Leiden, you don't see menus on the table, outdoor tables anymore. You see QR code stickers on the table. So small measures have already had a very big impact. And the other big impact, which is the amazing thing to report, is that for three years now, every single Sunday, a volunteer group of can canoeists go out into the waters of Leiden with this pla with the um, with the canal cleanup activity, still taking out um, garbage, still analyzing what they find and still taking action back to somebody with a report about we're finding your stuff here. Here's some suggestions about what you could do with since more than 600 volunteers having taken place, um, taking part in the activity, sometimes just for a fun day trip or group activity, but a harder core group of a good 20 to 30 people that have been have, have been going out pretty much every single Sunday for three years. So I leave it with you that this small initiative actually has the larger impact 
even though the turning off the lights of the entire city is a is a high impact public engagement event or public event, its ultimate impact was perhaps a little bit smaller. I wish I could be with you to take questions, but here's my email address. You are very welcome to send me an email um, to get in touch with me. I'd love to compare notes, um, hear things from you about what you're doing um, in your in your home base and with your local projects. And I hope that we'll have other opportunities to crop paths in person. Thank you very much for your time.